Hello, this is Simone from Epica, and you're listening to One on One with Mitch Lafon. Rock on. Welcome to One on One with Mitch Lafon. Joining me on this episode, it is vocalist Mitch Malloy. We talk about his new album, Making Noise. Malloy Master Tracks is his studio, and of course, his time with Van Halen. Before checking that out, please check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, M I T C H L A F O N. One on One, Mitch Lafon. Head over to YouTube and find me there. And now, here is the one, the only, Mitch Malloy. We are speaking with Mitch Malloy. The new album is Making Noise. And uh, you've also got new management, uh, Doug Goldstein, formerly uh, managed Guns N' Roses. So that's all exciting news. New album, new manager, and of course, a tour of Europe coming up. Uh, pleasure uh, to speak with you, Mitch. Pleasure to speak to you. Yeah, exciting times. And, and by the way, you've got a, you've got a great name. Mitch, I love it. <laughs> your name, your name is better though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Uh, I, I stole it from you, but yeah. So, so talk to me about these ex- exciting times. Um, first of all, let, let's get into the the management thing. How did you get hooked up with former Guns N' Roses manager Doug Goldstein? I did a show in Los Angeles. Uh, Two weeks ago, I think it was. It seems like a year ago now because time's flying. But um, I I headlined the uh, the Whiskey A Go Go, and a a Facebook friend of mine was a friend of Noel Kim, who is a publicist in Los Angeles, and he sent her to see me. She came to see me. She immediately wanted to work for me, so that happened. We went to work, and um, I actually was um, was getting quotes from some rock star friends of mine for the CD. You know, like he looked at the CD, so I asked him to you know say a few nice words and a few friends like that. And um, I asked Nicole, uh, no, Noel, sorry, um, uh, if she had any kind of you know big people that might listen and might give us a quote. And she, she apparently did. <laughs> and Doug was one of those people. So in the course of maybe three hours, uh, Doug went from, she you know, contacted him. He went from, you know, let me check it out to on the phone with me saying, I want to manage you. I mean, literally three or four hours later after she contacted him, that's how fast it happened. Well, wow, that's great. And, and and of course, you know, it's because the album uh, Making Noise sounds so great. I've had a chance to hear it, and it really is a solid, solid rock album. So let's talk about uh, Making Noise, because this is one of these albums where you're all alone, right? When you look in the booklet and the credits, it just says, Mitch Malloy, you did producing, all the instruments, the mixing, the mastering. You wrote the songs, you sang the songs. Is there anything else you did on this album? <laughs> well, everything is everything, Mitch. <laughs> what else can you do? <laughs> well, I mean, does that include the artwork and stuff too? I mean, did you did you put it, put it all together? I don't do artwork. Okay. I do do I do do editing. I did edit the video. I yeah, produced and edited the video. Um, so you know, I'm one of those guys, Mitch, that if something needs to be done. <laughs> I just kind of roll up my sleeves and do it. Um, You know, I just, I've always been like that. I've always sort of thought to myself, well, if somebody else did it, why can't I do it? And, you know, and of course that's not always true, but if you approach life like that, you can get a lot of stuff done. Yeah, I agree with that. So, yeah. And I think that in my case, it comes from my dad who would always say to me, if you want something done right, do it yourself. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, okay. Yeah. So, 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 t- yeah. yeah, your dad said the same thing, right? So, so talk to me about the challenges though, because, you know, when, when you produce yourself, sometimes you don't have those outside ears to give you guidance and say, hey, maybe you should try this. Maybe it could use a bridge here. Maybe the chorus. So, so talk to me about putting it together and, and what kind of sort of, checks and balances went into making sure that it wasn't just a giant ego trip or it wasn't just a giant, like how did you 
approach it? Well, I'm glad you brought the ego thing up because the only reason I didn't want to do it was because of the perception of doing it. You know, I mean, other musicians and producers and, and probably fans as well uh, would look at that and go, what an egotistical a-hole. Like, why, why would anybody do all that themselves, you know? Um, and that was the only thing that almost made me not do it is just that people would think that, you know? Um, but here's the thing. I've been very lucky to have been uh, very successfully producing a lot of acts. And in doing that, I become proficient at a lot of things. And, and also in doing that, I've been with other people a lot. So it just came to the point where I thought, you know, it'd be kind of nice to just be alone for a while. And let me see if I could even do this, right? So the first song was um, Life Has Just Begun. I wrote it and I recorded it and it was done. And I thought, that turned out pretty good. Let me see if I can do that again. And then I did my therapy. And I thought, wow, that turned out pretty good. So I might have something here. I might actually be able to do a record all by myself. So I was checking in kind of with myself as I went and I did it in pieces because I was producing other acts at the same time. So it wasn't like I had a three month window and I could, you know, boom, just do my own record. I, I wish I had that luxury, but I didn't. Um, so, but yeah, so, so I, and at the same time, I think to answer that question, when you, you shift gears and you go to work for somebody else and then you come back to another project, whether it be the making noise CD or somebody else's project. Cause I oftentimes produce two or three acts at the same time. You have a freshness to go back to the other project after working on another project and you have fresh ears and you have fresh perspective and you can go, ah, like you, you really see things differently than if you were just working on that record only. Right. So I think that's the answer to your question. Just the fact that I'm busy um, kind of served me well in this case. Right. You it know, sort of I clears think. your hair and then uh, clears your hair, clears your head. <laughs> it clears your head and then you can come back to it with a new pr perspective. So the songs themselves, yeah. though, did you have the entire, uh, you know, the, 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 the 10 or 12 songs put together all at once and then you recorded them in a spaced out kind of way? Or did you have, I have one song and then two months later, oh, hey, I have another song. How did the songwriting process come together? Okay, well, it was it was kind of a um, in between what you just said. Um, I didn't have it all, no. Okay. Um, and but it but it was less than say two months per song. So um, there are little groups I would say, like where I would write maybe a few songs in a in a few days, and then I'd have to move on to something else. Um, and uh, so. But I did have the luxury <clears throat> most of the time to write after I wrote the song, record it, or even even in some certain certain uh, songs, I was able to record them while I was writing them. So, you know, it, that was kind of cool too. Uh, I I've, I've never really done that, where you're sort of you think maybe the song is one thing. And then you start recording it and it turns into another thing because you change it. You're just, okay, well, you know what? I don't like that. I'm going to change it. So it was really interesting project for me. Were, were any of the songs written for other artists in mind? Like, do you, is that something that you do where you write for other artists or do you normally just write for yourself and your own uh, albums? I absolutely write for other artists. In fact, I usually don't take artists on unless I co-write with them because, um, I mean, let's face it, most artists don't have the songs. That's usually that's usually the key, you know. Right. Usually they've got this and they've got that, and 
it got enough to make you think, wow, you know, we could really have something here. But usually they're they're missing the songs. They'll have ideas for songs and they'll have pieces of songs and they'll have things that warrant being made into a song. But but mostly they don't have the songs. So I have no choice but to co-write with them to create what we, what we think is the best song we can, you know? And so I do like, I do do that. So yes, I do write for other artists, right. but no, these, these songs were all written very personally for me, but I was in a space where I just needed some downtime. I needed some alone time. And um, the, my therapy song came and, and I, I was going to call the record, my therapy. Right. Was, that was sort of the feet, that was sort of the theme of it. It's like, wow, you know, I really need some chill time here. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, this, this record was just written for me. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that you mentioned that thing about songs because I have a friend who's a higher up at, at Sony and every so uh-huh. often I'll bring him a band and say, Hey, check this out. And the, he, he'll always say the same thing. He goes, he goes, yeah, they sound great, but I don't hear any songs. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah. Right. It has to have a, a chorus and it has to be catchy and it has to like, you go, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me talk about some of the other things you do. Malloy Master Tracks, which is your uh, full service production facility. Um, talk to me about that, and uh, you know who can come there. Is it is it anybody? Is it just high you know h- higher up clients? Uh, how did you get into setting up a studio? That came um, very naturally, very organically when I was very young. I started putting a studio together, I think I was 18, is when I first started recording myself. <clears throat> so I had that goal to, you know, man, I want to have my own studio. So, you know, I built, I built a little demo studio and, you know, really early on, you know, before people were doing that. And, um, and I got my record deal with my little demos that I made for my studio and, and those little demos called Glow 88, which is a CD that's out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got myself my own deal. And then the label said to me, okay, bitch, it's time to um, make the demos for your record. We've got a $20,000 demo budget. We're going to go to Blah Blah Studio and we're going to do it. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 we're not. You're going to give me that $20,000 and I'm going to invest it into my studio and I'm going to do my demo. <laughs> and they said, okay. So, you know, I got a big uh, a shot in the arm from from RCA uh, for, to invest in the studio and I've just been investing ever since. Okay, so so talk to me about this because you were assigned to to RCA. You did have a single that had some heat. You were on the Tonight Show. You had Mickey Curry play, who was who is Brian Adams' drummer or was you McDonald, who listen, people don't want to hear this, but was essentially Bon Jovi's bassist since the very first album. Even though everybody thinks it's Alice John Such, but <laughs> we know it's not right. true. Uh, right. You, you had all this heat. You had all this stuff. What happened with RCA? Is it, you know, Nirvana hit in in that time and the whole music industry fell apart? Or did they not support you? Where did things go right and where did things go wrong in those early days? If I can ask the question that way, I know it's sort of a leading question, but... Well, no, no, it's a very good question. Right. Very, very important. Um, Yes. I was their sort of golden boy, if you will, uh, for the first single, uh, they pulled out all the stops. I went to every radio station in America, literally every radio station. Like it was three cities a day, three cities a day, right? It was insane. The schedule I was thinking to myself, I cannot wait until I can go on tour and only do one city a night. Yeah, wouldn't that be, be fun? So it's going to be so easy, you know? So yeah, it was amazing. Like I was absolutely blessed <laughs> with the opportunity to work that hard. I like to work hard and that was hard work, but so many artists don't ever get that shot, you know? So <clears throat> that was a great thing. But the thing was, yes, during that whole campaign, Nirvana came out and just, 
exploded onto the scene. And the scene changed in that moment. The scene changed. And they just, I was not the flavor uh, of the month. I was not Nirvana flavor. Right. But and, then again, neither and, was Poison, neither was Def Leppard, neither were all these bands that have had huge success. No, but, Suddenly they were all out the door. But they, but they were, but those bands were, were way before that. Right. They got their success before Nirvana. And I was trying to get success at the same time as Nirvana. Right. Twice as hard. <laughs> Twice as hard. In yeah. fact, three times Impossible. as hard, probably. Right. Exactly. Impossible. It didn't happen. I, I probably had the most success out of anybody coming out of the gate at that time doing what I was doing. So, you know, I was able to get a hit on the radio. I was able to get on Leno. Um, so, you know, n- n- I see, you know, many, 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 many uh, bands came out that were that did not get those opportunities. So, right. again, you know, I was lucky to get as far as I got. Really. Oh, so, so then, because it was difficult, and because the times were just not appropriate for for the music you were making, what kept you going? Because you know, you look at your discography. There's albums in ninety two, ninety four, ninety five, two thousand. Like it, it's just nonstop. Why didn't you just say, okay, let me go to my studio and be a producer full time? All right, let me go be a mastering guy full time. You know, let me go work at the state college. Like, what kept you motivated and and moving forward? You know, this might sound corny or lame or whatever, mm. but when when you're born to be a certain thing or to be a certain way you just are that thing right so i when you have the facility to be able to continue with your art despite the pitfalls despite the struggles the mountains you have to climb you have no choice but to do that art man it's like you can the songs right they just want to be written you know the songs they just when i when i'm in that place the songs just go they just come you know i wrote maybe for the for the making noise record sometimes two three songs a day that record so it it's just i mean not to brag i'm just trying, I, I don't want to be both no 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 it's not a brag at all i mean most artists will say i wrote 40 songs for the album here you get to hear the best 10 i mean that that that's a normal yes. uh, kind of thing to say that. right I, I've done that as well, but in this one, I didn't. This one, I wrote 10. Well, I wrote 11. I wrote 11 songs and 10 got on. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a very valid question. And people are like, dude, you're tenacious, you know? And I'm like, you know what? Call it whatever you want, but I just am this. This is, I'm a guy that sings and writes songs and produces records. That That's who I am. That's what I do. So I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and you should. So, um, boy, let, let, let me see what here. There's, there's so many questions to ask, uh, which is all right. Let me let me ask you then about the the one thing that everybody asks you about. You know, the cliche question, if you want, Van Halen. Yeah. You you've talked about this who? quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. Who? <laughs> Never heard of them. <laughs> um, is, what what was that relationship like? You know, how how does Eddie Van Halen find you? Is it, you know, he's hanging out at the, at the, the Roxy one night and you happen to be there. Like what's the, the big, the genesis of this relationship? <laughs> well, yeah, that's ironic that you would say that because actually I played the whiskey two weeks ago and it was my LA debut. So I have done almost zero hanging out in LA, <laughs> but um, he found me through Steve Hoffman, the late, Steve Hoffman, who used to be my road manager. So Steve called me one day after I'd moved down here to, to Nashville, and he said, you know, I have this offer to move to Toronto and work with Ray Daniels. And Ray, you know, he's got this one and that one. and He's got he's Rush. He's got Van Halen. Halen. Yeah. Yeah, he's now, yeah, he's got Rush. Now he's got Van Halen and da-da-da-da, blah, blah, blah. 
And Steve and I are old friends and totally love Steve. I mean, we were on the road together for a long time and um, great guy. And I said, I think you should go. I, he's like, yeah, but it's Toronto and I'm such a New Yorker. And <laughs> Steve was from Long Island, massive accent. And um, I said, Steve, look at what I've done. Like, I'm from Dickinson, North Dakota. Right, which is not New York, granted. But the cool thing about my life is that I I got to go to all these different places, and I had got to kind of grow my career and grow my life. And there's a lot of value in that. So it's not like you're going to Dickinson, North Dakota, from New York, dude. You're going to Toronto to work with Ray Daniels. Come on, like the no-brainer. Go. And he did. He went. And I don't know, maybe six months later or something, he called me and I hadn't heard from him in that long. And he said, are you sitting down? And I said, uh, I can. Let me sit down. <laughs> What's up? And he's like, you're going to be the next singer in Van Halen. That's great. And I was like, what? <laughs> are you high? What, what are you talking about? Like, you don't even smoke pot. What, right. What's wrong with you? Right. So, um, yeah. So you know that's kind of how that that started. It was it was Steve that plugged that in. And, and so, uh, obviously, the band has you down for auditions because they they want to see you in the flesh and and check it out and and see if they like you, kind of thing. Um, how was that walking into the room for the very first time? Because I mean, you're not just looking at a guitarist. You're looking at Eddie Van Halen. Which, you know, like or like, you know, whether you like Van Halen or not, it's still Eddie Van Halen. Uh, how was that? And not, to mention, not to mention Michael Anthony and Alex Van Halen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who? Uh, no, I'm kidding. But yeah, I mean, yeah they, but I mean, they, seriously. They okay, let me let me just let me just because this this isn't in the documentary because you know he didn't have time to put the whole story. You know, it would have been. A, half an hour documentary and that would have been boring right but so so i pull up you know they 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 fly me first class out there i have a limo the nicest limo driver you ever met in your life and i'm delivered to 5150 studios which is on the property of ed's house right so we go up the hill and i'm like here we go here it is you know, he opens the door. Ed opened the door, actually. Ed opens the door. He's like, hey, there he is. And they're lined up, like outside, lined up to greet me. It was surreal. Like, you know, sometimes in life, I think everybody has this in their life. But right. something is going on that you just, it just doesn't seem real. Like it's so out of the norm. <laughs> <laughs> that it's just hard to take it in. It's hard for you to process it even. Well, I've had a few things like that happen. The latest one was Doug calling me. But yeah. that that Van Halen one was was one of those. It was times. one of those, yeah. It was it was just like what is even happening right now? Like it was just whew, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I listen. I know that feeling very well, and, and and if I can share a personal story, about a month ago, I was standing on stage for the Hollywood Vampires, Alice Cooper, Joe Perry, and all that, and they said, "Watch the oh. show from here." And I'm sitting there going, "I'm standing right next to Joe Perry, uh, ah. and and the rest of the vampires." Like that was talk about surreal. But so so you know, the Van Halen thing didn't work out and, and I've always found this ironic because the quote has been that for some reason in your life it wasn't the right time and the one song that you demoed with them is called It's the Right Time. So um talk to me about that song and the Panama demos and all you know the the, the working up of the older songs and why it wasn't the right time for you. Because, I mean, it's Van Halen. I mean, even if you had done a six-month tour, you probably could have written on that coattail the rest of your career about, hey, I was the guy who was in Van Halen for six months, right? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. You know, but I don't know. It just wasn't... Why do you make the decisions that you make in any given time? You know, I, that's hard to say, right? I mean, I I go... I go primarily on gut feelings and it was clear to me that there was something amiss. So 
why kind of, you know, why continue? You know, it. who knows really what the real story is and what was actually happening. Right. Like, I don't, I would never be so you know, pretentious right. to say, well, this is what happened and da 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 and blah, 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 because I only know what I know, you know? I only know. But but was know there what... was there a fear or an insecurity that oh my god I can't do this or was it or, or was it nothing like no. that it just, no okay wasn't that no 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 I'm okay. I'm a pretty confident guy okay okay um and 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 Ed made me feel very confident in okay. the things that he said he was very complimentary and I won't say what he said because then I will sound like an a hole but but he was extremely nice and Valerie was also very complimentary and extremely nice. So it wasn't like that. It wasn't like I felt like I wasn't good enough or, or whatever. It was just that it seemed like they were uneasy. And with the whole uh, presentation with Dave thing, you know, that they did for MTV. I mean, everybody kind of knows that now that that's why they did that. Right. Um, they were forced to, but I didn't know they were going to do that. It was just kind of like, what is really going on right now? And it was just a very strange time and it didn't feel good. And I was like, well, you know, if they don't want me, let me do them a favor and just bow know, out. Bow out. Yeah. Is there, is looking back on it now, is there any regret? Do you think, eh, maybe I should have just, sucked it up and gone through with it or or do you go you know what no i made the right choice and it is what it is well we just met so you don't know me but right i i am not the kind of uh, regretful okay i'm a kind of live, live in the moment kind of guy I, right i'm right. not I, i've been blessed with with that i think i mean i don't because i know a lot of people lament about their lives and they lament about their decisions but I am not that guy. I, I am like, well, that's what happened. Move on. Okay. Person, you know? Um, and I'm sure people will look at me and go, you're an idiot. <laughs> um, and maybe they're right, <laughs> but, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I don't look at you as thinking the, Oh, what, what an idiot, because to me, the, a band like that, it, it's almost a lose-lose decision. If you don't do it, you lose because you don't do it. And if you do do it, you lose because you're always that guy who's not Dave or you're always that guy who's not Sammy. Yep. And, and that that can also put a stink on a career, you know. So it's it's a hard one to it, – it's really a hard one to make to make anything out, right? You know, it's it's a hard decision and, hey – I think it turned out well for you. The new CD sounds great. Making noise is, is well, fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that CD wouldn't be here had I not made that decision. And and my wife and child would not be with me. I, yeah. I wouldn't have a kid. I mean, you know, I yeah. mean, it, it, it. So I wouldn't change that for the world. I mean, that kid is my whole entire universe. So, yeah, you know, I mean, it is what it is, and. Um, I just kind of move on from it, and and I I I think though you know and maybe this is your next question I don't know but but it didn't feel like the right time but if Ed was to call me today I would certainly you know entertain that I mean I but I don't anticipate that happening and I'm not fishing for that but I just everybody always asks that question and and um you know I I, I Here's the thing. I want to make the best music I could possibly make, right? So if I can make better music with Eddie Van Halen and Alex Van Halen and whoever the bass player is, you know, whether it be Wolfie or whatever, then I want to do that. I'd want to do that with Joe Smith across the street, you know, if there was a Joe Smith across the street. He was amazing. So I, I'm, you know what I mean? I, I'm pretty... Um, simple and pure with that like i just want to make the best music i can possibly make and obviously you think about van halen you think wow those guys are amazing we could make amazing music so that's exciting to me quite honestly 
know? So, yeah, I mean, that would be fun. Yeah, but I, but I actually very much respect your decision because, like I just said before, it, w- it was almost a lose-lose decision no matter which way you yeah. went. And listen, look what happened to Gary Sharon. I mean, yeah. I-, I think yeah. they made some great songs together, but the fan base just didn't want to give it a chance. And it probably would have been the same for you. They probably would have just said, we don't care. You're not Dave. You're not Sammy. Go away. And that's not a, that's not a great place to be in. Uh, the great place nope. to be in, though, is your uh, tour coming up in the UK and then, of course, Greece, Denmark, and all those other places. Hopefully, you'll make it up to Canada at some point. What are fans going to see on this tour? They're going to see a lot of hair, man. <laughs> a lot more than me, that's for sure. No, so a lot of hair, and they're going to see... Quiet hair is what they're going to see. Um, well, what are they going to see? They're going to see a great band supporting me, you know, on stage with me, I mean. And um, I'll be doing mostly the first album because that's what the Europeans love. Uh, they love that album and they want to hear it. So I'll, I'll play it for them. I'll play a couple songs off the new record and a um, couple scattered in from, you know, other records. And uh, it's just a high, high level of musicianship going to be on that stage. The vocals are probably the best I've ever had in a live band. And um, I mean, the other vocals, I mean, you know, Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited about it. And hopefully, uh, like I said, hopefully we'll see you in Canada at some point. I think uh, we need more Mitch Malloy because the voice is there. the, The songs are there. The new album is great. Uh, especially that song that you keep mentioning, My Therapy. That's a great song. Um, I'm trying to think what the name of the mm-hmm. other one is here. Hold on. <laughs> I'm looking at it right in front of me. What was the other one that I really dug? Uh, not Doug Goldstein. Um, uh, <laughs> it was uh, Speak of the Devil, and there was also uh, Life Has Just Begun that I really thought were fantastic. So, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, those were the, some of the earlier ones. Yeah. Yep, those are... Those are all part of the early batch that I did. And uh, there you go. Uh, Mitch, great pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much. It, yeah, we, we've been talking about doing this for a while. It's great that we finally did it. Yeah, we had uh, we were going to do this like six, seven months ago, and it, it didn't work out for X, Y, Z reasons. But here we are. We got it done, and I think it was great. It was, it was a great, great interview. Thank you. And uh, Appreciate it, Mitch. good luck on that tour, and... Uh, it's going to be wild with Doug. I mean, he's a crazy, crazy man. So <laughs> you're going to have some cra- – there's going to be another chapter to write in your book, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm excited. It's, it's, this is a really exciting time for me. It really is. Yeah, and uh, there you go. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Yeah, okay, bye. cheers. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with singer Mitch Malloy. The new album is Making Noise. Some great Van Halen stories in there as well. Please check me out on Twitter at Mitch LaFawn, one-on-one at Mitch LaFawn on Facebook, and paypal.me forward slash Mitch LaFawn if you care to support the podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. And uh, there we go. Bye for now. Oh, my.